Hello and um, welcome to this evening's um, Friday talk at Mansfield College, the last one of this term, but certainly not least. Um, we're absolutely delighted this evening to welcome Patrick uh, Cabanda, who is going to talk to us about his excellent book, uh, The Creative Wealth of Nations, and the subtitle is Can the Arts Advance Development? Um, I've heard Patrick speak about this at the university, uh, university um, at the Department for International Development before, in the before times when we used to meet um, in real life, um, and he's a very good uh, speaker. He's also very well placed to talk about this subject, being a Renaissance man. He is both a Juilliard trained um, organist and um, a Fletcher trained international affairs professional, and his work um, has um, informed many people, including um, the World Bank. But what I particularly like about the way Patrick speaks about um, the role of um, the arts in advancing development is the very human, very holistic way he talks about um, development and indeed wealth. So welcome, um, Patrick. It's fantastic to have you with us. And I think you're going to speak for um, about 25 or 30 minutes, show us a very short film, and then um, we can open up for questions and answers from the audience. Uh, thank you so much, Helen, for that kind introduction. And also I want to thank Vanessa and others in your team who have uh, worked so hard to put this talk together. And of course, I want to thank the audience who have tuned in from all over the world uh, to join us today. But also I want to uh, thank you particularly because, you know, yesterday was World uh, Book Day there in the UK and in Ireland. And I'm happy to talk about my book right before World Book Day. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and also, um, you know, I am here in the US in the East Coast and I rarely get to address people uh, during lunchtime. At the same time, also addressing people in the UK during dinner time. So we can say that this talk is a prelude to lunch and dinner, which could make, I think, another <laughs> good book title. But today also, I realize that today is also our world unplugged day, day of unplugging in that we should not be on our devices or zooming <laughs> virtually. So thank you for making an exception for me to zoom in for this discussion. And today also is a um, world employee appreciation day, which I think is important for many essential workers and employers at Oxford and your own college who are working tirelessly to put uh, these talks together and to indeed keep the university running. Now, talking about the book, uh, the book really discusses two uh, major themes, as you just uh, said. One of our themes is to do with the economy, how the arts indeed does contribute to the economy in terms of GDP or just you know, pure economics, if you look at it that way. But then the other theme is how the arts enrich our lives in ways we can't really measure. But just because we can't measure these ways doesn't mean that um, the arts contribution that way is not important. But uh, in that framework, the book then is divided into four parts. Uh, of course, before I begin the parts, we have the front matter, and I must acknowledge now um, the great Amartya Sen who wrote the forward to the book. I see that he spent some time there at Oxford, and I was looking this up, I remember that, oh, also Adam Smith spent some time at Oxford. <laughs> and you know, if my book's title, if you take away the the word creative is really the wealth of nations. So <laughs> it's really nice to uh, be able to connect these uh, themes uh, from Sen to Adam Smith and as we talk about uh, the creative wealth of nations. So in the book I follow up with a prelude which is really um, I think will be the preface but I went with the word prelude just to keep uh, musical themes followed by acknowledgements and also overture and an overture in this case is will be an introduction. And um, so the first part of our book has three chapters and chapter one is on the unmeasured, untapped sort of value of, of the arts and how, why we should and how we can look at that. And then the second chapter is on arts education, which will be a very big theme we'll talk about in this discussion as, uh, a little later. And also then we are going to look at uh, chapter three, which um, is to do with the arts and environmental stewardship. And that video will show from Paraguay is concerned uh, with that chapter. And part two of the book uh, deals with international trade in services, in this case, uh, cultural uh, services. And chapter four 
uh, really uh, sort of sets that out using the WTO framework or World Trade Organization framework of modes of supply. And then chapter five goes on to talk about artists without borders in the digital age. And chapter six is on cultural tourism. Now, this becomes quite important today and I wish I was focusing more time on it just because just the other day on March 1st, Dr. Ngozi Okonjolela became the first African and first woman to lead the WTO, which is quite remarkable as the di director general of the WTO. So um, she is from Nigeria. And if you've seen the book, as you will quickly notice that chapter, that part two, chapter four, five, six, really uses Nigeria to explain the things I'm going to do, partly because China Chiba is a very uh, big influence and his book, There Was a Country, really enriched my understanding of how Nigeria works and the culture there. And also um, um, Nollywood, which the Nigerian movies, which have contributed tremendously to Nigeria's economy. But also, I think Nigerians, um, the pride they have reason to value and their own stories they have reason to value to tell. Uh, and part four of the book carries, um, um, oh no, no, I, will, I skipped part three. Part three of the book, as an, an, I talk about the unsettled question of women in the performing arts. Now that becomes important and I wish we were talking more about it, partly because this is also uh, Women's History Month. And you know, with our Me Too movement and Hollywood, it's not all glory in the performing arts. And then chapter eight um, discusses the arts and mental health. Um, and I think that um, when we look at the issues of mental health and the arts, especially in the time of COVID, spending time on the internet is really draining. COVID itself um, is really taking a toll on our mental health. But when you look at it, we're also taking nature walks and landscape architecture coming into, into play there. And we're going to look at how people look at um, zooming and really streaming music to stay really mentally healthy. And this is important because in the book, I talk about the issue of um, the first wealth is, is health as uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson correctly put it. So, and that health also includes our well-being. And I think how the arts can contribute to our mental health is very important. And uh, finally, and, uh, part four of the book is to do with data collection. What kind of data should we collect? And um, how can we do that? But finally, which I call the finale or the conclusion, deals with imagination and choice. And I, I argue that regardless of the data, I think what we really need to do is to open our minds and also uh, look at how we can imagine and make better choices. And here, I think I cite two quotes. One of them is not how good you are, but how good you want to be. That's one of our quotes I think I talk about. And also the, the other quote, which is always said uh, so much is to do with, it. it's, it's like, we need, we, we, we need to create the future we need. Okay? We, we have, we can create it. And that's to do with imagination and making choices. Now to dig uh, more deeper, I think I'll focus on part one, starting uh, with chapter one, where we have two movements. And I mentioned that I call these movements partly because um, I'm using a musical uh, language. If it was a symphony, it would be the first movement of a symphony. <laughs> so anyway, here we go. So uh, part one, uh, what happened is I bring in the idea of the economic value of our music or the arts contribute to the economy. And indeed, when I was writing the book about 2014 or 2015, in 2013, they had the United States Economic Bureau Bureau of Economic Analysis went and updated how American GDP or gross domestic product can be calculated. And what they found in that calculation is that they, 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 they could create a new category called intellectual property products, uh, which includes investments in artistic um, creative work, um, um, basically art or artistic originals, and other things to do with literature, literary works, research and development in the area of entertainment. And this indeed, in these kinds of fixed investments in this in creative work added 3% to the United States gross domestic product. Now, 3% may be a measly 3%, but actually that comes up to $400 billion. Uh, it's a lot of money. <laughs> so, um, so indeed, that's what you just to try to see how the arts um, things do with creative work contribute to the economy. And I argue that if they even did more and they could do more, we can actually find this even way much bigger than that. But Nigeria, uh, also in the same year in 2013, uh, did a similar exercise. 
and what happened the Nigerian economy know that the Nigerians are known to always come up with things. <laughs> Uh, these uh, emails asking you to send one million dollars to the prince <laughs> of some tribe, but this is not that kind of thing which was like that. They really went and calculated uh, to see how can they capture things which are not really uh, previously captured. So what they found that by really including the fast moving parts of the economy, including the telephone and the movie industry, the economy went up um, 90 basically percent overnight. Now, again, as I mentioned in the book, it doesn't mean that average Nigerian uh, became richer, <laughs> but it just shows us that if you start counting things um, which were not previously counted, it really makes a difference. Now, here, uh, what I must mention, I think chapter four, chapter five around there is that movies and uh, the telephonic communication tend to go together because imagine streaming, okay? So you need the infrastructure. And I think that's idea of where trade uh, culture leads, trade followers can come in there because indeed, if you wanna be able to transmit some of the uh, music or things on the internet, uh, music, movies and stuff, um, basically infrastructure, how it works well is very important. So it's not difficult to see how these two uh, places, if you calculate them, they actually can boost the economy. But uh, the other, um, I think things I should mention, K-pop, uh, some of you may know about um, Korea. Uh, Korea's K-pop adds a lot to the economy. I really cannot say the human rights issues which are concerning how K-pop is put together, but what we know is that it's indeed it's a huge, huge um, economic honor for Korea, at least that has been previously documented and I think still the case. But also we have something called the multiplier effect, which you may know uh, so much there in the UK, and the multiplier effect works like this. According to the Arts Council England, uh, the council estimated that every one pound of salary paid by the arts and culture industry generates an addition 2.1 pounds in the wider economy uh, and it does this by attracting visitors creating jobs and developing fields and attracting and retaining businesses and revitalizing places so this is not really that difficult to see but also one thing i want to mention here is the innovation uh, which i like so much when we're talking about innovation and creativity the arts are very important uh, when we're going either looking at green jobs or how can we make now even more like buildings which are more socially distanced and also actually climate change friendly. We need architecture, which is really art. And of course, landscape architecture, nature walks, art comes in there, how they could be designed. But my favorite example, one of them is Leonardo da Vinci, who really was an artist. Many people know him about his Mona Lisa, but he contributed so much to math and engineering and many, many things. And again, this is a wonderful example to show how the arts uh, do this. And then movement too, uh, very quickly, it argues that we should go beyond economic value, uh, looking at the social um, um, uh, contributions, which may be social capital. I have many, many friends, not just because I'm a nice guy <laughs> or that my friends are nice people, or just, but what brings us together, I have people from Japan, Brazil, Korea, Uganda. We don't speak too much the same language, but you know, from Egypt to, you know, Saudi Arabia to Thailand, all these four music tends to bring us together. So I think it's very, very important. And also the issue of social inclusion. I think UK, uh, like many other European countries, is struggling with refugees. And I think one thing which can actually be done to integrate refugees is really using the arts. And the EU has looked into this, and I'm sure Ellen knows so much about the issues of human rights abuses going around refugees, and how can we better integ integrate them is really to do with how we can use the arts. We also have the issue of trust, and Ken Arwa has collected right to say that each issue, uh, economic transaction we do, really involves trust. And again, we can't measure trust as such, but such important to really bring our social fabric uh, together, which actually, again, is uh, a contributor to our economy. Now, the most important uh, thing I want to mention, I think, today, or this, what this talk was really about, is in chapter two, which is arts education. And I want to go back to that talk, Ellen, you had, I gave earlier at Oxford, um, uh, where I quoted Oscar Wilde, one of your great, um, I think, uh, people who graduated from Oxford, uh, who said that be yourself, everyone else is taken. And that spoke to me directly, partly because when I was a child, I would be told how I should not play music and try to be an accountant, but I wanted to be an artist <laughs> and I wanted to listen. So I think we should, as we teach and we raise children and we support our communities and 
countries, we should allow people to really be, uh, basically develop their gifts fully and not try to make them be uh, something else. And uh, Oscar Wilde himself was quite a genius that I think one time he said that he had nothing to declare except his genius. And I think he was telling this to a customs officer. So indeed, he was quite a genius because another thing he said is to live is the rarest thing in the world. Most people exist, that's all. That's sad, but that's true. <laughs> that many of us really just try to exist. And I think this connects to Amatya Sen's work of people uh, doing things they have reason to value, and which I think he puts in a, that kind of human capability approach, which is so different in a way, as I mentioned in the book from human capital, because I think human capital tends to focus so much as, as economic productivity, not the well-being and flourishing of human uh, kind in many, many other ways. And that's why I believe that STEM is pushed so much instead of having steam where we can have the arts to help us um, really confront um, bigger problems with a much better way of looking at human beings. And this also touches on the issue of systems thinking, which I want to bring in. Um, and the systems thinking, we need to use it to make sense of a world from pandemics to politics. I had this talk on WBR Boston, which is um, one of um, NPR stations. And um, they argue that to solve a puzzle, we never just look at one piece of it. So why do we try to tackle the most complex problems of modern life in such a piecemeal fashion? Because we like to do silos. Then a universe is a silo. So the interview was between, um, uh, I think one of uh, uh, um, Meghna Chakrabadi, uh, the host of the, uh, the On Point program I was listening to, and also uh, Zeynep to Fechi. I hope I have her name correctly spell, uh, pronounced. And she's a professor, I think of sociology, down at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And she defines uh, systems thinking this way. Systems thinking is looking at the world as, as the interdependent, complex thing that interacts with each other over the time that it is. It, it basically is looking at the world the way it really is, which means that there are many things moving at once. They do not happen according to the way we have our academic disciplines set out. So I think uh, looking at systems thinking is very important. And that brings us to the issue of integrating the curriculum, where I argue that, you know, we really need to integrate the curriculum. And, and um, um, Helen, if you don't mind, please read that uh, passage by the Ruth Bernstein, which we find on page 52. Um, I think 51 or 50, yeah, 52 in the book, yes. I think maybe you are muted. Yes. <laughs> yes, I think I'd learned by now, but I haven't. Um, so yes, so Patrick asked, um, I think to give himself a pause and to have a different voice involved. <laughs> um, if I would read um, a passage that he quotes in his book from Michelle Root Bern Root Bernstein in um, Sparks of Genius, where she says, despite the current lip service played to integrating the curriculum, truly interdisciplinary courses are rare and transdisciplinary curricula that span the breadth of human knowledge are almost unknown. Moreover at, the moreover, at the level of creative process, where it really counts, the intuitive tools of thinking that tie one discipline to another are entirely ignored. Mathematicians are supposed to think only in mathematics, writers only in words, musicians only in notes, and so forth. By half understanding the nature of thinking, teachers only half understand how to teach and students only half understand how to learn. And then Patrick goes on, I'm going to just read the next sentence, Patrick, which says that this kind of education leaves out huge chunks of creative processes, and this needs to be reversed. Yeah, that's definitely need to be reversed because as again, we see from systems thinking that pandemic has shown us not really just about the economics, public health is really very, very important. And we really think about it in an integrated way. We are much better trying to solve these problems because the world is not siloed. <laughs> Indeed, it works <laughs> that way. So anyway, we go on now to the final chapter in this case. And I think Blackwell's your big store there at Oxford. Is that correct, Helen? <laughs> you have Blackwell's bookstore there at Oxford. Is that correct? Blackwells, yes, that's the one. Yes. yes, I think one student actually from Andover who goes to Oxford, I think she's a, he's a PhD student, told me that he saw the book there. So I will urge people to go get it if they want. <laughs> so anyway, so we'll just stop um, at chapter three. Uh, in this case, um, 
Uh, but uh, that chapter deals with, with the earth and environmental stewardship. And I opened up chapter with landfill harmonic, uh, which is the recycled orchestra down in Paraguay. It spoke to me uh, uh, so much because I think when I try to always promote us education, talk about the people like, oh, you know, but that's for rich kids or rich people are the ones who have a luxury. But these kids, the poor, are very poor material, they are, they are not poor in ideas. And I think that's important to realize what you can learn from them. But also the video showed me something which I'm trying to articulate and I mentioned this at the UN, um, I think um, maybe a year or two ago when we met there. And I was saying that consumption, I think the way we're consuming things is not sustainable. Uh, we cannot keep on buying things and things and as, except our, to be able to, to curb climate change that way. I, I, I use, I want to give you an example. I can go to a store and buy a small piece of item like this, uh, this pen. But you know what they normally do? They give me these big plastic bags and I'm shocked to tell them, you know, why are you giving me this? back and then they are shocked <laughs> even more shocked when they see that i don't need the back but you know those plastic bags end up in oceans i think now there's a big cleanup effort and uh, it's not right and also i hope this statistic is not correct but i read somewhere that it can take up to 500 years for some of those plastic bags to decompose if i hope that statistic is not true <laughs> but if it's true it's depressing and i think this entire thing of keeping on buying things and buying things i think how how can we find a more sustainable way of living so i think that video shows that we can do recycling and do i'm not saying that it, it sort of fights climate change but i think it opens up ideas and things we can do i think the idea of also communicating science uh, and the arts are very very good uh, there was a gentleman uh, who i think uh, his name is Wade davis he spent some time at Oxford looking at how Oxford University uh, Environmental Institute uh, works. And I think when he went there, he was um, surprised to see um, how uh, basically the public, what understands and what science understands and what the public understands. <laughs> so there was this, this, this disconnect and I think it was the Environmental Change Institute at Oxford. So that inspired him to start his own talks. And then he was even more surprised, as I mentioned in the book. He, he says that it's like telling people, oh, don't smoke, don't smoke. And then when you finish the talk, they go out and start, they all start lighting up cigarettes and starting to smoke. <laughs> it's like, oh, why should I, why should, don't I try something different? So he said that he, he would try uh, music. And I think he's now in Utah somewhere at the State University trying to do more things. We're trying to communicate uh, climate science and science generally through the arts. But also there are other people like Rachel Carson, Silent Spring. For me, that book, I think, is the system thinking 101, at least in terms of environmental stewardship. Because she, as she correctly argues, if I go and use all uh, these chemicals to kill off weeds in some kind of um, farm, maybe those weeds by accident will kill bees, which we need to pollinate uh, our plants. And we need to just look at that uh, also, because in a way, it's actually affecting the way things work, the entire ecosystem of our planet, but also that same chemicals may end up in the rivers and they kill salmon or fish, which actually is a live food and food for some people. So these things are very important. Of course, Mathai Wangari is also another hero of mine uh, who in Kenya was, I think, demonstrated, I think, uh, uh, the idea that they want to eliminate one big park there. And she fought to make sure, I hope that park is still there in Nairobi. But actually, when I think about it now, we have social distancing. And one of the things they've told us, if you can't go take a walk in the park, <laughs> And she was quite a forward thinker because there are things like parks are really important for our well-being. But anyway, at this point, I would like to invite Vanessa to uh, play our video of a uh, landfill harmonic, uh, which concludes this discussion. And I will uh, be looking uh, forward to the questions which will follow thereafter. Uh, thank well, you. But just before she does, can you just tell um, our audience um, who, who, who these people are and, and what they're, who they're seeing? Um, in the video. Uh, uh, who are these people? The Landfill Harmonic. Landfill Harmonic. Just, just tell people who they are and what, and what oh, yeah. So the Landfill Harmonic, I'm actually talking of uh, interdisciplinary or systems thinking. There's a gentleman who was, I think, working as an environmental engineer who was sent to this town. I don't know if I can pronounce it, but it's called Ketura uh, in, um, in Paraguay, somewhere there, near, I think, near the capital, someplace around there. Oh, I think ASEAN is the capital. But anyway, as he was um looking to try to understand how this landfill was working kids were coming into play he himself is a musician it turns out it's like why don't i actually just try to make some instruments for these kids to play well more kids came <laughs> and before you know you couldn't keep up <laughs> 
So he had to, I think, hire another guy who was also um, uh, someone who worked in a, in a landfill to try to uh, pick up items and make use of them. And they create, started to create instruments. So it became world famous to the point that Fabio Chavez, his name, said, you know, the world sends us garbage. We send back music. <laughs> so I think I've actually had them play here in Washington, D.C., um, um, uh, a recital. And I think uh, you, their instrument is quite an inspiring story, I must yeah. say. Yes. Right, let's see them. Thank you. I just wanted you to explain who they were before we showed this short um, video. Me llamo Juan Manuel Chávez, más conocido como Eddie. Tengo 19 años y toco el chelo. Este chelo está hecho de una lata de aceite, la madera tirada en la basura y las clavijas son de una vieja cuchara para golpear la carne y para hacer el ñoqui. Y suena así. Una comunidad como Caldeura no es un lugar para tener un violín. De hecho, el violín, un violín cuesta más que su casa. En ese grupo acá mismo encontramos el colado de violín. Y de ese empezamos a comerlo reciclado. La familia que acá vive recicla todo lo que hay en la basura y se vende. No pensaba antes que yo voy a hacer esa chumendo. Y me siento demasiado feliz cuando estoy viendo a un niño que está tocando un violín reciclado. Cuando ya escucho el sonido del violín, siento como mariposa en el estómago, así una sensación que no sé cómo voy a explicar. Bueno, la orquesta de instrumentos reciclados es una orquesta que toca instrumentos hechos con la basura. Dos, tres, y... Mi video sería sin la música, estaría de core. La gente se da cuenta que no tenemos que tirar la basura muy fácilmente. No tenemos que desechar a las personas muy fácilmente. Thank you. So, Patrick, that's very um, interesting and inspiring. And um, if people want to ask you questions, they now is the time they can do that in the question and answers box. Um, I wanted to ask you, there's a passage in your book um, where you, you, you've used this, this language of the, you know, the, arch, the arch capitalist economist, um, Adam Smith, talking about the wealth of nations. And then you talk about human capital against human capability and, and the role of arts education. And you say that those who advocate that arts education must be useful or make us smart in the instrumental sense are falling into a trap of seeing education merely as capital to augment production possibilities. And then you say education is more than instrumental as the Namibians put it, learning expands great souls. And we're now in a moment of enormous global human but also financial crisis um, and 
I wonder how in that context you think we can harness this language of creativity and, and, and explain why and you know, in a way where we make we do measure GDP in, in economic terms in terms of how much money do you make, how much money do people have? How do you think we can communicate um, this uh, joined up and holistic message that we have? Yeah, so I would actually argue that some of our problems we are facing, at least in the United States, we are directly thinking that the markets will always be the solution to our problems and neglecting investments in public health, public health infrastructure, issues of mental health, where there's research that okay, the arts are good for our mental health. And because we are busy trying to build things like huge buildings or whatever it is, uh, which we think is important, and neglecting things which really uh, to do with what may be called soft because we don't really want to see the immediate value. And I think, I hope this virus will teach us a lesson that human life is more than simple economic transactions. Right now we are all in pain because we can't see each other. Okay? People are crave for going to concerts, going to church, going to, uh, and, and that's I think what I'm trying to get at is that uh, it's, it's no more than just the economy and indeed we're in economic pain, but I think I've mentioned this previously to some friends or even in a talk that let's actually, we go back to the pandemic in, because it, when it came from China, it went to Italy, at least that's what I was seeing in the newspapers. I remember opening the newspapers and the, the images, I would see Italians going to their balcons and bearing out music and musicians. They are trying to connect and playing concerts across their um, so apartments so that people can listen to what they are doing and connect that way. Um, and then I argue that, okay, what if the Italian government said, oh no, just stay in your apartments and just keep quiet. We're going to send you 2000 euros per month. Or what if the EU said, yeah, indeed, yeah, we can also add another 2000 euros. Just stay home and just be fine, you'll be fine. Will that have worked? <laughs> I don't know. I don't think so because people wanted to go out and basically make themselves important. Now, I must say that the uh, investments are very, very important. But for example, right now we need a vaccine to understand, to get rid of this. But what if people who are actually using that vaccine are drawing from creative work? Okay. How can we understand, okay, maybe they are Leonardo da Vinci who are really able to look at these systems. How, do, how does this work? They are drawing from analysis from their musical training. In fact, I think there's a biologist at Stanford who say that he got a Nobel Prize in biology, say that his bassoon teacher was the inspiration for his biology. What if they said to him, don't go and study bassoon, you'll not make money, he will not become the contributor we have. So I think that's what I'm getting at. And the issue of human capability of Russia, Amatya Sen goes back to looking at the integrated nature of uh, really looking at human beings in a broad perspective, which goes to Aris, back to Aristotle and also Adam Smith. <laughs> yes. I hope that addresses that. Yes, yes. Otherwise, I could go on and on and on and on. <laughs> no, no, we to get other people in, but it's um, uh, yes, and people can can ask you questions if if they, if they want to, but it's um. I mean, it's true that the arts have been a way that people have connected in all sorts of ways. And the, the, mm. the, um, the, the French National Ballet made an incredibly moving film of people dancing in and practicing dancing in apartments with partners and children and, and, a, and, a, and how you can try and connect in some of those most physically engaged arts that you can't actually mm. practice at the moment. And it was very moving and there's been in this country you know, life drawing classes on television and all sorts of other things. Um, yes. but I guess the question is how you kickstart these um, things and um, Caroline has asked whether or how you think governments should best practically integrate, um, implement, I'm sorry, um, arts-based and environmentally sustainable policies um, in the present and future. How do you think, so how do you Ellen, think? I have, I have heard what you said in the end. Okay, I don't know if how, that might... how, she asked how governments should best practically implement arts-based and environmentally sustainable policies um, now and into the future? Okay, the first place they should start, don't cut arts education. <laughs> I'm appalled, like I think I just told you earlier uh, before this talk, Ellen, that you know, in the US they've now said that you know, if you are doing science, technology, engineering and math, they are going to give you privilege in terms of visas. I'm not trying to say that all creative people should just <laughs> cry to the United States, but it's very sad to see that they're not considering creative work. Yet actually what makes America strong in my view is their amazing diversity of creative talent. 
uh, which you've seen even uh, growing into the work in Silicon Valley, people like Steve Jobs and others, and many, many wonderful immigrant artists who have contributed tremendously to this country. So I think if we say that we are going to promote arts education, that's a start, because again, indeed land, learning expands our souls as the media and put it, and that also means curiosity. And that's what go, but if always arts are cut, <laughs> then what do people get? The students think, oh, it's not important. Let's just focus on. So I think that having a curriculum, which really, really says that it's important to have arts, and the governments have a big role to play because I can say uh, all I want to do cars come home, but I'm not a politician who's going to make all these kinds of pronouncements. So one politician who him and I have nothing in common with is Mike Huckabee. I talk about in the book. He actually mandated. Uh, and say that, you know, you can't get, a, a, I think, a high school diploma for art and so without taking 40 minutes of music. Because he said one of the ridiculous things we have done is really cutting out the arts to get the kids uh, really in school. So I think that, in fact, he goes on to say, what do companies want? Companies want teamwork. They want collaboration. Where do you get? I, um, I work with many artists who may be difficult, but the music sometimes helps us collaborate because I can't play against you. <laughs> We and we have to collaborate together. And those skills are important as we're trying to uh, uh, look at climate change, come up with better policies, or try to lead a more a collaborative world. And competition is very, very important, but also we need collaboration, which really is important because that's the way we can actually some, tackle some of these issues which are going to be cross disciplinary. Yeah. And this is very complicated stuff about human interaction and um, engagement with other people and other people's ideas and worlds. Do you think this is something that's necessarily government-led or do you think other act actors in civil society can do this? Yeah, yeah, I believe that it's important for others to come in. In fact, in many cases, for me, one of my complaints has been like, this has been left so much to NGOs and uh, non-government organization that we need, there's no and what happens, let's assume I like organ music and I suddenly believe that if you play organ music, you'll be smarter. So if I become rich, I have means, what am I going to do? I'm going to give those schools or churches who will promote organ music. But what if jazz piano is what really lacking in this part of district and we want to invest in it? So basically, because I don't have some emotional connection to it, I'm more likely to give. You see, those inequalities are really actually really there. <laughs> in that bigger and bigger schools get bigger and bigger money and they, because people want to give them because of prestige. And so I'm not saying this is entirely correct, but you find others struggling. You know, one of the most disturbing things I've read is that there are kids here in the United States who have got to, to McDonald's parking lots to, to park there to, so that they can access Wi-Fi to their homework. I find it appalling that in such a rich country, we get to that point. Now, should we say that Mike, Mark Zuckerberg or Google should help out? They've done these kinds of things that they are not actually adequate. In fact, actually I wrote a paper for the United Nations Human Development Program, which one, um, I think his name is Eli Broad, who can who actually say that, you know, we can't really sort of many of these problems by just looking at the non-profit sector. Now, we need it and we need it, but that's, that's not the solution to some of the things we need to be doing. The government intervention is very, very important and actually making sure that things are equitable. So, so you think the government has a, a, a central um, role and, and other things may be important, but, but not quite so central. And that leads on to a question that David Lewis has asked. Um, and he um, asks you if you think there's a risk that the arts are seen as playing um, an ameliorative, ameliorative role in development, perhaps slightly marginal, how can we ensure that they play a transformative role? Uh, transformative role? Mm. Yes, yeah, so uh, they're not the sort of nice to have around the edges. We, here we are, we have, um, you know, we have some, uh, uh, yeah. some public health yes, and, 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 yes, and- Yes, it's nice to have kind of, kind of talk, which Mike Huckabee attacks. I think Mike Huckabee says, as I know in the book, this entire, I think he says it's a stupid thing where he says, oh, we can't have the ask because we can't afford it. He says it's the most stupid thing we have ever done. <laughs> and um, so I think, yeah, indeed, when the pandemic came out, around that time, there was a word which was always harming, or phrase which were harming my friends. People would say that, oh, it's such a time to think around the edges. <laughs> we need to get to get things seriously. So now we have inspiration, the kids in Paraguay, that's not tinkering around the edges. They didn't wait for the World Bank um, 
some rich person, they went and really tried to do things. Ironically, what's very funny, what will happen is that some donors may come in and I actually do talk about this in the book, and then they want to give them new instruments and stuff, but, and that takes away the possibilities. But whatever the case, what I think their contribution was to show what can happen <laughs> when you can actually open up your mind and see the possibilities of how things can happen. And as they pretty much pointed out in that talk, those kids, many of them may not become the next great uh, artists uh, to be playing at Carnegie Hall. If they do, wonderful, and that would be great. But the issue of human development and their own leading their own lives, as I like to always say, um, when I went to Juilliard, when people ask me about music training at Juilliard, I always like to tell them that I actually never studied music at Juilliard as such, I studied life because mm -hmm. it did teach me how to deal with a lot of things which are quite tough, especially which I'm drawing on these lessons, um, especially in these kind of tough times of COVID. You have to be in a practice room for so many hours sometimes to just practice two phrases. <laughs> and now, you know, work from home isolation. So you are sort of mentally prepared and you see how you can deal with this. So I think it's nothing to do with just, we need to draw on it. And what I'm trying to get at is that we cannot wait for a big, um, everyone can do our own part. In my case, I think writing a book was part of it. It's a huge, huge um, undertaking. And I had a lot of support from Amatya Sen, Kaushik Basu, Muhammad Yunus, and many, many others. Um, who even endorsed my book. But I think that all of us can do our part. And also, I always say you can run for office. That's one thing I've, I've put out out there. Because there are two examples I know what, where this has happened. Mike Huckby, I mentioned earlier, being a governor, you didn't need statistics to convince him. <laughs> he just said, no, this is the law. Now, in Colombia, I may not, um, I, I, I don't know if the president there, Ivan Dicker, we are in the same kind of political philosophy and thinking, but he, has written a manual with a minister now of culture, who I know, Felipe, and the manual is called the Orange Economy. And him becoming president, the, the Orange the Economy is the creative economy. They call it um, economy in the lunge, which is the Orange Economy. And when he became president, the book, the things you're talking about, he's right now putting them into practice. But why? He's someone who understands the issue in his own way, whatever angle, and did not wait. <laughs> but being in charge and being president is some, it's not even a pet project. Yeah. Um, talk, talk, talking about um, the arts, one, one thing is how you, um, both economically and culturally, mm. export your, your culture and your ideas. And Mar uh, Marguerite Mariama has said that at one time, entertainment, which is, of course, an arts driven industry, was the second largest economic engine in America. Um, and she asks if you know where, where what, what percentage of the American economy is, is entertainment and arts driven today, but also can you speak more about this American export? And I suppose generally about both the economic and the cultural role of, of, of sharing different cultural forms and ideas, arts forms. Yeah, so yes, I actually, uh, I think if you look back in my book, I can basically go back to those numbers. And I think I mentioned some of that in my book when I was looking at the contribution. Indeed, Hollywood, I think California is actually the fifth economy in the world or something like that, just the state of California. And what is it based on? <laughs> Pretty much, Hollywood is a very big part of that. But what I think is very, very important to understand is that we should not be so caught up in just looking at what we can measure. The things we can't measure are so powerful and so big uh, that you may find that if we really take that time, it's actually bigger than that. So I think, uh, is it Joseph now you came up with this phrase called soft power? That's very, very important. And I, I think it leads to the, the issue of where culture leads to it follows. And I think in the UK, you have this area where, for example, the United Kingdom is known for its education, maybe even in English language training, and many people pay money to come there. And those are kind of, it's a trade, basically international trade in services, this time in education. I think in the UK, it's such a huge, portion. And I think we're concerned when the EU, when you get away from the EU, what will happen in the United States discussions have been there. Okay, well, if Chinese students can't come, what are we going to do? Some universities from, but actually that's very easy to see, even in terms of uh, the money's exchanged of the fees paid. But what if the next, you know, Leonardo da Vinci is going to come from Oxford, but then they can't come. <laughs> or an Oxford student who ends up in Paraguay, but they can't go. <laughs> So basically, and he was there and he started looking at these traditional instruments, got inspired to do something, comes up with the next big thing. We Basically, there are things we can't even imagine possibilities. So I think when you look at it, where culture leads trade follows, 
there are many, many ways where, where the arts contribute. In fact, you know, one thing I should mention here, Africa struggles so much because of a poor image and people are tentative to invest there and things like that. And what happens is that we, because of that, we lose out. Yet we can pro project our image in a more positive way. And culture is a wonderful way to do this. It actually will be probably a different story because America attracts a lot of talent, not because, at least in my case, I didn't come here because they have the best military, <laughs> but I came because they have jazz, art and music and all this um, basically wonderful, reputable education system. And those things um, are really important. Now, when I'm here, I've been teaching American students. I've been teaching students from Germany. I've learned from professors from India, from all over the world. So this kind of interaction, which you can't really put up an economic system, but it's a huge contribution to the economy, a general and well-being. So that is, that's really interesting, that question of interaction between people from around the world and different cultures. Um, the film you showed was a South American orchestra of four children yeah. playing kind of high Western art. Yes. <laughs> and I suppose one of the questions is, is what yes. we're trying to do to project that onto other people or generate real um, uh, understanding of different forms? You know, when are you, when are you doing appreciation of another culture and when are you appropriating it? And when, when are you imposing a certain form on people? I mean, how, do we, how do we discuss what kinds of art we want to promote? And, and what that's telling us about who and what we value. Yes, yeah, so, so indeed, I think um, in Uganda, for example, when I was growing up, um, I like to say this, when you spoke English, you are very smart, okay? <laughs> now, when you spoke English with a British accent, you're actually really smart. <laughs> when you speak with a Queen's accent, because I think you have this <laughs> accent, or oh, then you are definitely from, um, you are even at a higher level. Now we spoke with the New York accent, you're quite sophisticated where you come from. <laughs> so it's very interesting in that came about the music also that we grew up being told in my case, African music is a bunch of noise really not. And that has diminished the way we appreciate even our own culture. I remember at my own cathedral trying to look at how can we introduce jazz and uh, gospel music. And some people were like, oh, no, no, no. We have to be like, you know, St. Paul's Cathedral. <laughs> Because this is the way they, and it's wonderful, it's great, but I think it's not nothing to do with the way that you can actually have more diverse areas and learn from some things like that. In fact, for me, I'm lucky that I started to play in the hotel to make a living, and there people demanded, hello, Dolly. They wanted to hear um, um, African traditional music and stuff, and I needed to go home to actually then incorporate this in my learning in my in my own way so that I can then get a broader framework and get to appreciate things like take five which is now really five which you can really find so things like those are uh, I think important and I think it should not be like we should impose and this has been done I think one person who was asking about David was asking about uh, the arts not playing a, a much or bigger role sometimes because they use the sugar coating and sometimes what we want to use uh, to promote our maybe called agenda is sometimes the way it is. And the politicians are very smart. <laughs> they <laughs> get this and they can use the arts to uh, do whatever they want. But I think the way is to try to open our minds to be like, where can we find strength and diversity and beauty in even things which are different from so ours? Ironically, or what's interesting, many, many very good composers and even scholars look at Amatya Sen and others. Um, um, Messian, they look at different kinds of cultures and stuff and try to blend and look at connections. Messian's French into birds. I think if we go to the Congo, it will notate, it will be <laughs> like a kid in a candy store notating all these sounds because uh, he did similar trips, I think, to Israel, went to Japan, I think, Indonesia to try to look at, he uses Indian rhythms in his music. And what if he said, oh, only French music would be great? He would not have become, I think, contributed. Even Steve Rake, with his minimalism, when he went to Ghana to study African drumming, he drawing that, and actually right now is considered America's top composer, partly because of his way to look at how you can use the rhythms he learned from um, Ghana to incorporate his own compositions. Well, Patrick, this is um, wonderful, and um, I do um, commend to anyone here um, Patrick's book, um, 
which is published by Cambridge University Press, but never mind, it's still a very good book. Um, and yeah. one question, Patrick, is whether it's available electronically. I don't know if that it is available electronically. Yes, actually, I had a student, I think, from South Africa yesterday asking me that she will be at the talk and she was wondering because it was hard to get the book in South Africa. Yes, indeed, Cambridge is very good at this. They have the book in paperback, they have it in hardback, and they have it in uh, soft copy, which is an e-book. So if you go to the Cambridge website, you can just put in the title to come up and you will have these options. I think on the left of the, um, of the website, uh, the, on the right, you can click in and it will show you the options of what you can buy on the Cambridge website. But I think others, Amazon and others, really carry the book. So it's indeed available in all formats. And, 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 and finally, really, because I think we want to bring it to a, cl a close and let, and, and let you um, have, a, have a break. But I just wonder, um, Erica Chan has asked which country you think, in which country you think the arts contribute most to the economy. I suppose that's a very broad question. I mean, where do you think does this well? Bringing together oh. creative and uh, creative education and, and supporting development. Which country does this well? Which, which post to choose? Yes. Where would you say, look at that country, if they can do it, go and do likewise, think creatively about how well, to that's a very that's a, it's a, it's a tough question, but I think there's an easy way to answer it, not to sidestep it, but really to answer it well. It's like looking at food and look at, okay, well, who is the best at Indian food? Which restaurant <laughs> would be better? Which restaurants will actually do better Thai food? Or which restaurant would be better Ugandan food or UK food or Irish food? I think what will happen, you can go to Colombia to look at how is their orange bond working, especially for students who are doing research. You know, the president issued the first orange bond, which is to try to finance it. Is this really working? What is it going on? So you can learn orange, from their model. Patrick, just tell me, an orange bond, explain what an it's, orange bond is. An orange bond is look at the creative economy bond. You know, they, they use what? the creative economy as a, so you can actually, someone can Google this. If they want, they can contact me to send them feedback. Mm -hmm. But the president issued a bond. The first of its kind, I think if I can, if I think from what I know, to try to finance creative work. In, in, so I assume, Helen, you want to write a novel. They can <laughs> sell a bond and people will buy a bond for the novel. I think something like that. So they will definitely, that, that can be something to look at. Now, if you want to look at copyright, who is doing copyright well? I think Taiwan, which I talk about in the book, the Taiwan Intellectual Property Association. I've mentioned this in many places because I think it's the best place I've seen where they really do teach copyright. Even... <laughs> from kindergarten, but they don't stop there. They go to judges and explain because copyright can be quite tough to know because sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not bad. Where do you find the balance? So Taiwan is for that. You want to look at how movies grow from organically in Hollywood, maybe a place to go. You want to look at how a country like, um, how does movie shape a culture? Maybe Bollywood in India, maybe a good place to go. You want to look at okay, how does classical and jazz and, and African music play? Maybe America, Nashville, or whatever it is, that jazz. <laughs> maybe that's concept. Arts education, maybe Korea, maybe Japan, or maybe German. I don't know. Um, I actually think that was it in Ireland, uh, Iceland or someplace, they, some people have started to play music using uh, ice. <laughs> so, so maybe if you want to look at alternative methods of composition, that's a place to look. Now, Costa Rica which I just, uh, I think, gave a talk there with the Minister of Foreign Trade. They are very good with nature tourism. Uh, I think they are number one. Maybe you want to go there and look at, okay, how do uh, nature and tourism work? How does this create with a creative economy in terms of nature works and things like that, sustainable development in that framework? So maybe you go there. South Africa, music and um, um, what you call it, music and uh, liberation. How can we draw from the South African experience? People like Lake Dube um, and many, many others who have used the arts to actually propel even the civil rights movements here? How does the uh, music ahead of a uh, few of the civil rights? So you could, I think, have different ways. And actually, as an organist, I should say, if you want to understand wonderful or carols, <laughs> the Cambridge, I think Oxford, you have wonderful lessons and carols, uh, St. Paul's Cathedral, the best hymns and things like that. So I think <laughs> there could be places you could look. Yeah. So this, so this is really about could you talked about systems approach is kind of integrating yes. the senses of themselves and I'm going to finish actually as Patrick kindly let me read a bit of his book I'm going to finish with a, a different bit from the prelude to his book where he talks about what motivated the book and you talk about what motivated what fueled your personal conviction um, that feeling and intuition are not impediments to rational thought 
they lie at the heart of its foundation. And that's what I think is so amazing about this book, that it does pull together that emotional um, and human response to the world and a rational one about how we can make life better for people in um, all sorts of material and immaterial ways. Um, so thank you very much, Patrick, for um, a wonderful talk and for sharing some of your work with us. And I hope people will take up some more of it and, and, and read the full developed thoughts. That is the last of our um, Mansfield Public Conversations for this term. Um, and next term's offering is not quite yet up on our website. We're finalizing some of the dates, but we will have them advertised on, on the Mansfield Public Talks page of our website. So please do go there and check check, check out. Um, we'll get them up as quickly as we can. I can tell you um, that the term card of speakers, we will be online again, I'm afraid next term. I hope we'll be back um, in person as well as online in the autumn, but next term we will just be um, online again. Um, but these talks are then available um, the whole of this term's talks are going to be available on YouTube and you can look at that whole back catalogue or wait for the new ones. Um, the first talk is going to be the 30th of April, Friday the 30th of April at 5.30pm um, UK time. It's uh, rescheduled from this term when a, a power outage in KwaZulu-Natal prevented us from the hearing from um, Dick Gang Mosoneki, um, but Justice Mosoneki is an extraordinary speaker. That's going to be a joint talk with the Bonavero Institute of Human Rights. Um, uh, Justice Mosoneki was imprisoned at the age of 15, was at, uh, on Melbourne Island for 10 years um, and ultimately became a, um, a, a Deputy Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. It's a quite extraordinary story. Um, so I hope you'll join us for that. Other speakers um, confirmed for next term uh, include Dana Dennis-Smith, um, the founder of the First 100 Years Project, talking about the history of women in the professions and celebrating that. Um, and Tristram Hunt, the director of the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. So I really hope that will be something of interest in our talk series. And um, if there are people you want to hear from, please let me know because um, I often ask amazing people and they're nice enough to say yes. And so thank you very much, Patrick. Thank you on Staff Appreciation Day for everyone who's helped me put this talk on. Thank you all for joining um, and good night. Thank you so much, Helen. It was wonderful to be here.